Romans 1 16 we are in a series called gospel 101 last week was entitled first things first this week it is called the message is the power the message is the power for I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek for in it the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written the righteous shall live by faith father I beg you this morning that as we hear the gospel of the righteousness of God once again and we've heard it for years it would not come to us as God good advice but good news gospelize this church this morning with the good news that we are now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus help me to communicate it in Jesus name and everyone said amen you may be seated How many have ever heard this term, paradigm shift? How many have heard that term before? We're experiencing a paradigm shift. That, has, that phrase has been applied to the culture recently. Sociologists have told us that in the last two or three decades, or maybe longer, Western civilization has experienced a paradigm shift. That term originally was used in connection with the scientific world, not the cultural political world and simply stated a paradigm shift is said to be a change from one way of thinking to another a transformation a, a sort of metamorphosis a radical change from one form to another a paradigm shift occurs when an old paradigm is seen to be obsolete and, and false and gives way to another. For example, uh, in the business world, in the commu computer world, has experienced a paradigm shift. How many remember, uh, it wasn't that long ago, that what you have in your laptop would have filled this room at one point, the bulky mainframes, and very few people understood the paradigm shift that was occurring in the computer world. Thomas Watson, chairman of IBM, said this, last, famous last words in 1943, quote, I think there's a world market for maybe five computers. <laughs> Ken Olson, chairman and president of Digital Equipment Corporation, his famous last words in 1977 are, quote, there's no reason that anyone would want a computer in his home. My favorite, by the way, has nothing to do with the computer world. It's an internal memo in Western Union from the year 1878 when the author of the memo said, quote, the telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is inherently of no value to us. These people did not recognize the paradigm shift that was occurring in the business world. Of course, it's not just the world of science and business or politics or technology which has experienced paradigm shift there was there has been radical paradigm shifts in the religious world as well the protestant reformation was a paradigm shift a paradigm shift a powerful transformation in the way of thinking of from one th uh, way of thinking to another and by the way the Protestant Reformation didn't occur because someone thought uh, it would be neat to have a paradigm shift at this moment it occurred when a man was struggling with answering the question how can a man be right with God 
Luther was asking that question because as a professor of the Bible, he was tormented in his reading of Holy Scripture every time he came upon the word righteous or righteousness. It tormented Luther's soul. Do you know why? Because Luther knew that a righteous God must punish sin. And therefore he knew that he was under condemnation and the wrath of God. And so Luther said, the caricature of God that I'm discovering in Scripture tormented me. I hated God. He said literally. Because I found no way out of my dilemma. But one day, studying the very text that we've taken up this morning, one glorious day, he sat in his tower studying Romans 1.17, and he experienced a profound paradigm shift. And here's what he said, quote, But when in God's grace I pondered in the tower and heated room of this building over the words, He who through faith is righteous shall live, and the righteousness of God, I soon came to the conclusion that if we as righteous men ought to live from from faith, and if the righteousness of God should contribute to the salvation of all who believe, then salvation won't be our merit, but God's mercy. My spirit was thereby cheered. For it is by the righteousness of God that we're justified and saved through Christ. These words which had before terrified me now became more pleasing to me. The Holy Spirit unveiled the Scriptures for me in this tower. This is more than a religious experience that would be gone in the morning. This was a profound, radical paradigm shift, not just for an individual man, but from a way of thinking that a whole culture had been enculturated by the idea that faith alone could not save you, but works with faith were necessary. Luther experienced the great change that one experiences when one believes the gospel, when a person renounces their their own ability to make themselves righteous and trusts in God's righteousness alone. And that's that truth which transformed the soul of Martin Luther from a guilty uh, terrified soul to a happy, cheered soul by the gospel, that truth would change the world. These verses were uniquely Luther's verses because they opened up a whole new way of understanding how to relate to God. And those of us in this room would not be here, arguably, if Luther, 500 years ago, had not burst into the light that God makes men righteous by faith alone. Now, in our text this morning, Paul is writing in a letter to the church at Rome. As far as we know, he's never been to Rome. And he has set his sights now on going. It's not a recent development. It's clear from the Pauline record in Acts that he had always intended to go to Rome. And his hope now, we're told in the 15th chapter of Romans, is that Paul might get to Rome and have the Roman church help further him to the farthest extent of the Roman Empire, which is Spain. And as far as we know, he made it to Spain. His hope was that the Roman church would help to send him to Spain. So he decides decides to write to the Romans a letter and to establish himself with them. But what will he write? There's no evidence that Paul started the church in Rome. In fact, most evidence is that Jews were in Jerusalem at Pentecost for the, ha- for the festival and were bombarded by the Holy Spirit. They were Romans, and they went back to Rome, began to preach the gospel, and plant the church in Rome. 
What will Paul say to the Romans? Because most of, if not all of his letters, were written to churches that he had established and were now in need of some form of correction. But Paul didn't start the Roman church. And as far as he knows, there isn't a need for correction, although I would say that one of the theological things he does in this letter is to help a church understand the relationship between Jew and Gentile. That occupies chapters 9 through 11, and it's a central focus of his letter, no doubt. But he can't correct these people or act as their apostle. He is not. So he decides that he will write a letter laying out to them in logical form the gospel that he believed and preach. If he's going to establish himself with the Roman church and get them to help him to go to Spain, he will give them his theology of the gospel. And this becomes important because Paul knows that in Rome as elsewhere, this gospel that Paul preached was everywhere being maligned and misunderstood. So he decides the best thing he can do is write in a reasonable and logical fashion why it is that he preached this gospel of the grace of God that had been uniquely revealed to Paul. And in the introduction of the letter, he says, I've longed to come to Rome. And he tells them, for I am eager to preach the gospel to you in Rome also. Now there's a practical reason for that. You've heard this statement. All roads lead to Rome. Are you guys, are you breathing this morning? You look very tired. Do you want to go back to the beginning? No, 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 we'll wake up. I always threaten people with that. Paul wants to go to Rome because all roads lead to Rome. And the fact is, in Rome, every religion, every sect, every cult had its hearing. In Rome, was represented there. Rome was what it was, the mother of the empire. All religions, if you want a hearing throughout the Roman Empire, you have to go to Rome at some point and establish yourself there. Paul says, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you at Rome. It could be intimidating to go to Rome. I mean, you step into Rome and you see temples to every god, offerings, coliseums, all of this religious activity going on. But Paul says, I'm eager to go to Rome to preach the gospel there as well. For, and that little preposition for is the Greek word gar. It means really because, here it is, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am willing to step into the city of Rome and defend the idea that a dead Galilean carpenter was raised from the dead and now is ruler of the universe. Now why would Paul say I'm not ashamed of the gospel? Because the temptation was there to be ashamed of the gospel. And Paul knew what that felt like. He makes a statement to the Corinthians, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. You have to understand, to go to Greek cities where philosophy, human rhetoric, and human wisdom is extolled and step off the boat telling them that the answer to life is put your faith in a dead Galilean, Galilean carpenter who God raised from the dead and who is now seated at the right hand of power, that was, he calls it, foolishness. Stupidity. But Paul also said it was the power of God. Pagans who heard it were transformed by it. That meant wherever it was preached, not only did it transform those whom God was calling, but it also solicited reproach, ridicule, and aroused opposition and persecution. 
By the way, this should be of vital interest to you and I because this generation is tempted to be ashamed of the gospel as well. I'm not saying you are, but how many have discovered that preaching the biblical gospel is not popular today? You didn't come this morning, I hope, to find out five tips for health and wealth. Six steps to a better business. I hope you came to hear that a dead Galilean carpenter was raised from the dead and is seated at the right hand of God, and that is your only hope and where you put all your faith. Because if you haven't, then I'm the most boring preacher you've ever heard, but there are some at Trinity that would agree with that. It's easy to have a hearing telling people that God wants you healthy, wealthy, and wise, but tell them of sin and judgment and the fear of the Lord and that only the only way to be reconciled to a holy God is through the cross and you may lose your audience. And we were forewarned about that. The time will come when men will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate, accumulate to themselves teachers after their own lusts. And we are in such a time. So how did Paul overcome the temptation to be ashamed of the gospel? John exhorted us not to be ashamed. But there are theological reasons which, if you can grasp, will overcome your fear of being ashamed about the gospel. And here's the reason, the first reason. By remembering that the gospel is the power of God for salvation for anyone who believes. The gospel is is the power of God. In other words, the gospel doesn't set up a power encounter at the end of the message. That's not what Paul's saying. We can't wait till the preacher's done so we can see the power displayed. He's saying the message is the power. And this is so critical. And the reason it's the power of God, listen carefully, is the gospel and the gospel alone has the power to deal with human beings' central need. Now, you have many needs this morning. You have the present need of staying awake as I preach this message. I'm sure there are financial needs in people represented here. I'd be in that category. I'm sure there are health needs. I'm sure there are job needs, there are home needs, there are a multitude of needs. If you ask people this morning throughout Knox County, what is your greatest need, you will probably get the following suggestions. More money, health, more time. (laughs) One of my greatest needs that I struggle with is more time, but the more I pray about it, I still only have 24 hours. Better relationships, better jobs, all of these needs exist. And most people, when asked, what is your greatest need, would probably say that. But when we come to Holy Scripture, that is not what we are told our greatest need is. The gospel is the power of God because it deals with our central need. And don't, don't turn tune me out saying, well, I've already had the gospel. Deal with that. You need this every day. The gospel is the power of God because it removes every obstacle in the way to, so that men and women can live in a right relationship with God. According to Paul, this is the greatest need. Paul says that it's the power of God for salvation. The Greek word translated salvation there is also translated deliverance. Now here's where the gospel becomes boring. Because unless you know what you need deliverance from, you will not make much ado about the gospel, which is why in the Bible Belt the gospel is boring. Boring. 
Because we're generally good people. We're generally, I mean, we're, we're, we've got our quirks. We, some of us battle cigarette smoking and others probably could do not being so sports obsessed. But, but I'm not that bad. I, I'm okay. And we, we determine those categories of our okayness by what? By comparing ourselves to ISIS. Yeah, they're bad. They're bad. We're a little bad, but we're generally good. But the fact that the power of God, uh, the gospel is the power of God for, for deliverance, indicates, how shall I say it, that human beings are in deep trouble. Forgive my French, we're in deep doo-doo. We are in trouble according to Scripture because we're at odds with God, we're at odds with people, and we're at odds with ourselves. We're also in trouble in the future, which John alluded to, because the Bible is telling us, not only in this portion but everywhere else, unless we're rescued from our situation, we are not only on the pathway to increasing frustration and despair, but it will end in the wrath of God being poured out on me for eternity. Hell awaits those who are outside of Christ. And so the gospel, according to Paul, is the word of rescue. It teaches you that you can be rescued from the guilt of your sin so you are restored to a right relationship with God. Then you can be rescued from your pride and self-will so that you can be in relationship to man. And then you can be rescued from the feeling of guilt you've carried all your life so you can have peace within. Again, I want to say, notice that Paul says the gospel, the message, the content of the message, not the loudness of the preacher. Neil, the gospel is the power of God. And we often think that the message the preacher preaches is okay, but we want to, it's the power at the end of the message. Now, it is true. It is true that the Bible speaks of God's power being manifested in the miraculous and signs and wonders, and I believe that, and I, I have seen it work. But the ultimate display of power, Paul says, is in the message itself, not in the fact that the message sets up a power encounter. And you know why it's powerful? It rescues everyone and anyone who believes. Paul says the playing field is level. If you're Jewish, if you're a Gentile, I'm a Jew by birth. I had to come to God through the gospel. My rightness with God could not be achieved by works. And trust me, uh, we Jewish people have tried that. We invented works. We perfected it. Paul says... The gospel is the power of God for deliverance for everyone who believes to the Jew first. And the reason we Jews got it first is we had the privilege of the promises in covenant with God that He would bring Messiah. But don't look at that as a privilege only. Paul will make the point that Jews are in greater trouble than Gentiles because we have the written law of God and we still didn't believe. And we, are, we will be accountable to God for that. Now, he says, the gospel is power because it makes people right with God. It's the power of God because in it, as we come to this final verse this morning, are you with me? In it, the gospel the righteousness. Now here's where you got to connect the dots because it's the power of God because in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. 
The gospel is not a first about meeting my felt needs so I feel better. You know, when I hear the gospel preached today, people are, come to Jesus, you won't be lonely anymore. Come to Jesus. My evangelist who preached when I, the night I was converted, he really lied. He said, come to Jesus, you won't have any problems. I came to Jesus, I got a whole new set of problems. The main one being, how do I tell my Jewish parents what I've just did? <laughs> that was a real problem. Now, why is the gospel, why is it that through the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed as I bring this to a close? Well, there's a problem that God has, and I, I'm speaking as a man. God has no problems, but let me put it in human terms, and, and it's been called the great dilemma, and here it is. How can a holy, righteous, pure God relieve people of guilt without violating justice? Because we have the idea that God is love, and therefore He could just forgive us because He loves us. Let me ask you a question. Who, pray tell, would keep the law in Knox County if every time you violated the law, you committed murder, and you came before a judge, and you just said, oh, judge, I'm so sorry, I had a bad day, I didn't mean to, and the judge just felt love for you and said, you know what, go your way, I love you. <laughs> Who would bother to keep the law in Knox County? Now, a judge might have compassion on a transgressor. He might feel compassion well up in his heart. He might know that this guy has, comes from a terrible background and he committed this crime because the social environment he comes out of his heart. I mean, you know, all of those things. And he might be moved by compassion, but he cannot forgive simply because he loves this person or is moved by compassion. And the great dilemma, which only the gospel resolves, is God must find a way to forgive sinners without violating His justice. Because His justice demands that His wrath be displayed. Some of the newer translations of the New Testament have been a little bit embarrassed and moved away from the great term propitiation, which is found in the Roman epistle and the Hebrews epistle. Propitiation. And it doesn't mean I had one guy say, yeah, I know God's with me in whatever propitiation I'm in. I said, that's situation. <laughs> Not the same word. They moved away from it and said sacrifice of atonement because propitiation is the bloody sacrifice in which wrath is expended and, and expunged. And it's the idea that wrath is borne by another. And they, got, they softened it a little bit. But that's exactly what's at the heart of the gospel. Wonder of wonders, Neil Silverberg was under the wrath of God, but personally for me and for you, Jesus of Nazareth took into Himself the wrath which I deserve, and I stand, there's a miracle at this morning, I stand before you this morning righteous in the sight of a holy God. Paul is beginning to introduce in Romans 1.17 the great doctrine which Luther discovered in the upper tower, the doctrine of justification by faith alone. And it transformed his soul. I came to understand the importance of this doctrine years ago. At Trinity, when I would come up to altar calls and pray for people. And, I, and 75, I'm being, actually being modest, probably more, of the people standing before me, would, I'd say, what do you want prayer for? Condemnation. Not that they were wanting, they were, I should rephrase that. 
Yes, I'd like the gift of condemnation, please. They were coming up because they felt condemned. Now, I'm a Bible teacher, and that made me nuts. I can't just pray for people. I would try to counsel them and teach them. But most of them didn't know the doctrine of justification. So I would say, you know, you need to see me this week. So coming out of every altar call, I'd have five appointments with people where I sat and taught. I'm not making this up. Where I taught the doctrine of justification. That if you're a Christian, you're done with condemnation. The NIV says, for in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. It's revealed. It didn't, nobody, how shall I say this? Nobody on this planet could have ever come up with the gospel. It's revealed. And we're going to unpack the doctrine of justification further in this series. Because unless you're well grounded in it, I agree with Martin who said it was the doctrine or article upon which the church of God stands or falls. Do you know this morning? Do you know? Do you live in the good of the truth that you stand righteous in the sight of God not because of your performance or your lack thereof but because of faith in Jesus Christ who accomplished a perfect righteousness, and now God has imputed that to you. It's your standing by faith, and if you are weak there, you will have a miserable Christian experience. Every other religious approach has the person doing something to be in right relationship with the gods. The gospel is revealed by God that He makes men and women righteous by doing nothing but believing. Paul says in closing, it's the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith or from faith, for faith. I like the way Charles Kranzfeld, a commentator, paraphrased it, verse 17. For in it, a righteous status, which is God's gift, is being revealed. A righteous status, which is altogether by faith. Literally, one translator said, out of faith, into faith. See, what happens is Satan wants you to start the Christian life by receiving Jesus by faith and then subtly, subtly insinuate, get busy. You got in by faith, but get busy. And you see, your standing is always by faith, not by performance. And the only way you're going to preach the gospel to yourself, I did a little devotional for our staff in our Wednesday staff meeting. I said, no one talks to yourself more than you. You're either letting yourself talk to you or you're talking to yourself. And if you're talking to yourself, you can preach the gospel to yourself. Okay. So much for that revelation. But I love this idea that it's from faith towards faith. Uh, One translator actually went beyond the text, but I don't think he's far out when he translated it from God's faith to our faith because faith is given by God. You don't bring it to the table. When He regenerates a man or a woman, He gives them faith. But you don't stop there. You move into more faith. Faith grows. I listened to a sermon recently which quoted from a great book for ministers and said, the biggest reason for lack of ministerial ministerial success 
is the want or lack of faith. And Paul then closes our Roman text. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Do you know what Paul's quoting here when he quotes Romans 17b, the righteous shall live by faith? It's a quote from an obscure Old Testament book that nobody reads. I actually love this book. It's the prophet Habakkuk. Get the name right. You got to spit when you say it. The Hebrew letter chet. Sorry for the front row. Habakkuk. You know that little book? It's a great story. When the book opens, I, I think I like it because when the book omens, opens, Habakkuk is complaining to God. And by the way, you can do that in prayer as long as you're prepared for the answer. And he's complaining because God seems to be overlooking the wicked and dealing harshly with the righteous. Have you ever felt that way? No? I have. Maybe it's a Jewish thing. And God responds to Habakkuk and says, you're bothered about that. I'm going to really mess things up. And, and, And he says... Get ready, Habakkuk, because, and I'm paraphrasing, but I'm close to the quote, I'm going to do a work in your days that nobody would believe if they were told it. I'm going to use the most wicked people on earth, the Babylonians, to punish Judah. Now, you couldn't say, that's akin to me saying, We in Knoxville are especially wicked, so ISIS is coming here, and God's going to, God is going to use them to discipline us. Which, now that, no, I'm not going to go there. Didn't even think about that, but, but he tells them the Babylonians are going to be the instrument of my correction. God says in other prophets, I'll deal with the Babylonians They'll be destroyed too, but right now, they're my instrument of choice. And then he says in chapter 2, write this vision down, record it. Again, I'm paraphrasing, but that's what he said. But he gave this caveat, for the righteous shall live by his faith. Very important words. Some commentators have translated that this way. He who through faith is righteous shall live. And by translating it that way, it clearly is focusing. That is why Paul uses it in the Roman and Galatian letters. That quote, it's quoted in Galatians 3.11. He quotes it here in Romans, and we'll do so again. It is the statement of justification by faith. Translated that way, it makes it clear that men and women are righteous through faith, and then they live. But by the way, it also corresponds with the very structure of the Roman letter. Because in chapters 1 through 4 of Romans, the great, where the great doctrine of justification by faith is taught, the, the word faith occurs 25 times, and the word life only occurs twice. But in chapters 5 through 8 of Romans, uh, the word life or live is quoted 25 times and faith is used once. So in chapters 1 through 4 where Paul is talking about the doctrine of justification and how the playing field is level, both Jews and Gentiles are guilty and can come only through faith. Faith is used 25 times, whereas from chapters 5 through 8, live or life is used 25 times. Both affirm that righteousness is only achieved first and foremost through faith, and that when men and women have faith in the gospel, they live. It's expressed through divine life. By the way, the reason Paul quotes Habakkuk 2, 
is there's a correspondence. Habakkuk is told by God, button down the hatches, Habakkuk, because I'm going to do a work in your day that you would never believe even if it's told to you. And guess what? That same paradigm applies to the gospel. The gospel says to Israel, I'm going to do a work you cannot imagine. I am going to become a man and I'm going to die on a Roman cross. And that's the only way that sinful men and women will be justified. Forget trying to be justified by law. It's going to take me becoming a man and dying a death, the most horrible death at the hands of Romans, so you can be justified. The same thing applies. I'm doing a work you will never believe. That's why Isaiah 53, the great chapter of the suffering of Christ, starts out with that question. Who? Who? Who in the world has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Who would believe it? I laughed at it when I first heard it, even though my brother, who was a drug addict, who had been delivered from drugs upon believing the gospel, when he brought to me that believing in Jesus is the only way to gain eternal life, I thought it's stupid. As a Jew, it was offensive. I thought Jesus was a Catholic priest. I did. Who went around sprinkling people in Israel with holy water. Who could believe this gospel? You have, and you stand this morning perfectly righteous in the sight of God if you believe the gospel. Now, hopefully we'll make clear in later installments of this series that believing the gospel is not mere uh, intellectual assent. The evidence that you really believe the gospel, as John put it earlier, is that you've given your life to Jesus Christ. There's a lot of people who mentally assent because they grew up in homes where Christianity was, or some form of it was practiced, and they mentally assent, yes, we believe in Jesus. But that belief transforms your life. Now, your transformation is not what you depend on for your standing, but it's got to be in evidence. And we will unpack that further in our next installment. But let me pre-warn you, next week the message will deal with you got to know the bad news before you can know the good news. And those who serve us in the Word next week are going to really make it bad. (laughs) So that the goodness of the gospel might be seen. Stand with me.